chairs like we from what we had the other day. But you and Mom are good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, it's very fitting. I'm going to teach this morning for a few minutes on prayer. We've been talking about spiritual growth the last few weeks. And uh, we've been talking about all the different areas, discipleship and, and assembling together and, and how fitting this morning with the service and the way things are going to speak about prayer. Prayer is what we need. Right. We have never had a time where we've had the opportunities to pray like we've had the last year. You know, I hear people saying, well, I've got so much time on my hands. Well, then you should be praying. You know, when, when we're in the red phase, I, I just don't know what to do with myself. Pray. You know, it's, it's a very simple thing. Pray. Prayer will move the hand of God and prayer will change things, but we have to do it in order for it to work. We used to have the little plaque that sit on our communion table at the front of the church that was put here by Sister Gloria Min, and it said, prayer, just do it. Just do it. You know, it's not something that's phenomenally uh, complex. It's just something we have to do. And so I want to just teach for a little while this morning. I, I promise it won't be too long. And, uh, but on prayer, I think it's very important. And, and probably I won't get through all of the aspects of it this morning, so we'll come back to it. But Luke chapter 11, verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. I just want to stop there. You may not receive what you thought you was going to get, but if you ask, you will receive. He that seeketh, findeth. Right. Have you ever went and sought for something and found something else? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. But the Bible is talking about seeking after God, you will find Him. And I've, you know, there's an illustration that Jesus used of the widow and the widow's might, and she sought the house and swept it diligently till she found it. So we need to seek until we find it. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son asks bread of any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Right. James chapter 5, verse 13. Down to verse 17, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months. That's faith. Luke 18 and 1 says he spake a parable to this end. The man ought always to pray and not to faint. We're going to pray today together. Father, we're thankful today. Lord, for the privilege and opportunity we do have to gather into your house and Lord, we just pray that you administer to each one that's gathered into this place this morning. Lord, that your presence and your anointing would move in in such a mighty way. God, that you'd minister to us and bless us with your presence and your anointing. Teach us your ways, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And you may be seated this morning. And in our prayers, we need to pray every time that the Lord keeps us safe especially in the times we live. Prayer should be a normal part of a child of God's life. 
you should not have to be told that you need to pray. Right. You know, when you get hungry, and, and uh, the worst thing in our house is the fridge. Because when I'm hungry, I know where the fridge is. And when I know where the fridge is, I know how to open the door. And I know that in the freezer part of the fridge that we buy chocolate-covered almonds that come from Costco in the big bag. <laughs> and I take those fits every now and again, about once a night, where I go in and the bag opens up and, and the problem is, is the, the mouth of the bag is too big. And my hand will fit down in it. And, oh, my wife's here. You should be downstairs so you don't hear this. <laughs> She'll be putting a lock on the fridge. And I get down in there and I'll get a nice handful of those almonds and, and I'll, you know, I'll eat them and I'll enjoy them so much. Food for the body. I wish we knew and was that diligent all the time about food for our soul. The times we need to get down and pray and, and we find other things that distract us. If we was as hungry for the things of God as we are for the physical things, we would find the fridge of God, so as to say, and we would find our knees somewhere praying and talking to God. Should just be normal. Should just be like eating. It should be just something that we do. We should find a time in our lives that we pray. We want results when we do pray. We're not just going to get down. If we get down and prayed all the time and then things didn't happen, there's, you, I guess, first of all, we should ask ourselves, am I really doing this properly? You know, Jesus' disciples, I'm sure that they had been with him when he prayed. And the one thing they did say to him is, Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. In other words, there's something we are missing in our prayer life. Teach us to pray. I think when we pray and we're not being effective, we need to say, God, is there something I'm missing? Because I want to see results from my prayer life. We want our prayers to be effective. There's not a soul in here that would say, oh, I just want to pray and, and I don't want to affect nothing. The Bible expresses it that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The word effectual fervent is actually a single grouping of a word that translates into a single Greek word, energonimi, which means, comes from the English word energy. So the energy that is expressed from a man that prays, the effectual fervent, the energy of the prayer of a righteous man. The word availeth, it's not passive and weak. When you have a, a, a prayer that is effective and, and energetic, it's not passive. It's a prayer that has power. Right. Our prayer should be energized. It should be energetic. We shouldn't just pray and have a, a list of words that we write out and we pray them and then we feel we've done our job. Prayer needs to be energized with the anointing and the presence of God. It needs to be energized with our minds set on the things of God. It should be energized with us knowing what we're there for. We're not just there to have a little time. We're there to talk to God. In the concept of the righteous man, it corresponds with the energy that's being exerted. It corresponds with it. The righteous man, a righteous man who's one that has confessed his sins. What an exciting time that is to know that our sins are forgiven. That should cause us to have energy, the very fact that our sins are forgiven. We shouldn't get down and pray and say, well, you know, God, we should be thankful and excited because our sins are forgiven. Right. He's a man that's experienced not only forgiveness, but the Bible also talks about in the Lord's Prayer that he expresses forgiveness to others. He lives a life of purity. He follows the fruit of the Spirit and he abhors the works of the flesh. This is the righteous man. He allows God to do a work in his life that allows him to be righteous because in himself there's no good thing. Our righteousness, the Bible said, is his filthy rags. There's nothing about you or I that we can look at and say, man, I really deserve this. We look at ourselves and we're unrighteous in ourselves, but it's God's righteousness imputed to us that makes us right. It's the very fact that he died on Calvary for you and I. So the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now the word availeth much. It's, and, and I don't know a whole lot about English if, and uh, 
So all you English scholars here, I'm going to tell you what the, I read about it. It's the archaic third person singular simple present indicative form of a veil. <laughs> I see there's others that have got the same context as I've got. So I'm going to give you the simple explanation that I could understand. That these prayers affect the way things happen. And they affect the way God does things. The word availeth much means that your prayer, when it's energized, affects the way things happen, and it affects the way that God does things. Right. Wow. You mean that my simple prayer can affect the way things happen and affect the way God does stuff? Yeah. One guy prayed and it hadn't rained for three years. Six months. That's pretty effective prayer, if you ask me. Now, if a man can pray for that, now I'm just going to sidetrack for a second. Church, I think we can pray expecting God to diminish this viral impact that we've got in our world. If the church would simply get on her knees and, and talk to God, He could remove that so quickly. But do we really believe it? Are we really energized to pray for it? Are we just satisfied with the norm? Let's just go through the motions. Let's do our prayers. But the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, it moves the hand of God. It changes things. And it causes things to happen in the spiritual realm as well as in the natural realm. They're done in the present as the prayer is being offered. In other words, it's, it's not... The Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's talking about what happens right now. As I pray, I'm not praying, looking, saying, well, you know, it could happen three years down the road. I'm praying. I'm praying that things and those things that I pray about happen as I'm praying. God hears us when we pray. There's not a delay or a lag in God's phone. When we pray, He hears. Prayers are not answered based on who you are or what you've got to offer. God's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care who you who your last name is or what status of society you come from. He loves everybody the same. He died for all the same. He will hear our prayers as quickly as another when we meet the conditions when we pray. Now, you notice I did say when we meet the conditions, somebody said, oh, you think there's conditions around praying? Well, he taught his disciples to pray, our Father which art in heaven. There's some, there's some things about that we need to understand. Right. He didn't just tell them, just when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus didn't just say, say whatever you want. You know, just, just, just talk. You know, I've heard that before. That somebody says, oh, just talk. Well, I'll tell you, prayer is, has a context about it. Don't you like it when somebody comes up and the first thing they do is offer you a compliment? You know, it's not just you walk up and say, oh, you're looking good today. You know, you mean it. And they, they sense that. There's a, a sensing. And when you say, man, you really look sharp today. You know, there's something about your spirit uniting with theirs. And when we come to God and we say, our Father which art in heaven. What we're actually doing in that very first context of our prayer is we're acknowledging Him. We're not talking, the first thing we do is don't come to God and say, oh God, I've got all these problems. And God, would you look after these problems today? Our first part of our prayer is always acknowledging God for who He is. What He's done. So when we meet the condition, He's listening. And his response is not based on your position in the church, right. nor is it based on your years of experience, nor is it based on your seniority, nor is it based on your age, nor gender, nor is it based on your popularity status, or your monetary status, or where you've been, or who you are, or what you come from. God's not moved by the verbal bombshells that we can let out of our mouths or by our lengthy prayers. It doesn't mean one thing to Him, and you can find that in the Scripture when He talked to the Pharisees and Sadducees about their long-winded prayers. Right. Flattery doesn't move God. He doesn't need us to flatter Him. I hope this doesn't offend you. But it's just the truth. 
God knows who He is. We don't need to tell Him. He, he does want us to, to worship Him. He does want us to recognize Him. He does want us to acknowledge Him. But He doesn't need us to try to base our responses on flattery. Fine oratability. There's some people that's great orators. Every, every English grammatical sentence is in place or whatever language they speak, they got it just grammatically perfect. Doesn't impress God. Grammar was made by man. I simply say that because my grammar sometimes... You, I, somebody said, you killed the king's English. I do. I can't help it. It's a good thing it does. It's not that that impresses God, or I'd probably be on the bottom of the list. But God's not impressed about the fact that you can put every word together and you can put the sentences together and you can, you can just verbally express things so well. God's not concerned about that. The most uneducated people in the world can still communicate with God and be just as effective in their prayer as anybody else. There's not a magic formula hidden in prayer that is only for a select few. It's not the fact that you just, oh, I've got to reach that pinnacle of the formula. And for all of us Pentecostals, it's not how loud we can scream or how much we can beat somebody or jump up and down that impresses God. Right. Gee, I better be careful I'm on the airway, ain't I? <laughs> it's not a secret for the select few. It's not something that just one or two knows how to do and everybody else just watches them pray and is so impressed by their prayers and says, wow, can that person ever pray? That was the problem Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees as well. They was impressed by themselves. He said, you're like a white sepulcher. You know, you've got the outside all cleaned up. Right. You know, people look at you and think, because all we do as people, we see the outside of an individual, but we really don't know a whole lot of what's in the heart. And Jesus said, you guys are like whited sepulchers. People see you. They think that you're spiritual. But you're missing something. It's not just for the privileged. Prayer is not for somebody that just, you know, you're, you're so privileged and, and, and you're the only one can pray because you've come from a privileged family or a privileged background or you've, you know, God's chosen you, but He didn't chose this guy. See, there's some principal truths in the Word of God that is set forth regarding prayer. And there's some fundamental laws that is laid out by God. And following those laws, God doesn't leave us in the dark. Same way with prayer. He gave us things regarding the subject of prayer and how to be effective in prayer. Do you know a lot of our New Testament is written about prayer? A little time we spend talking about it. There's a couple of points I want you to remember as we progress in this lesson this morning. One of them is this. God wants to meet our needs. Right, right. Did you hear? God wants to meet our needs. That's number one. Don't forget that. God wants to meet our needs. He's not up there saying, I want you to do it just the right way and then I'll meet your needs. God wants to meet our needs. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, He desires us to meet Him at the cross. So put the two of them together. God wants to meet our needs. He desires to meet us at the cross. Now what does the Bible say? By His stripes we are healed. He wants to meet our needs, but He desires to meet us at the cross. Those stripes that He's talking about was laid on Him Back in the days of the cross. It wasn't that we look at and say, He wants to meet our needs, but He also wants us to meet Him at the cross. His blood was shed for the forgiveness, the salvation of mankind. He wants to meet our needs, but we must meet Him at the cross. So when we look at the command to pray, it's not an optional thing in our journey as a Christian. It, it's, it's something that is mandatory. It's a requirement. You know, we have, when they said that, and I know there's anti-maskers around the world, but they say, it's mandatory to wear your mask. So we all went out, and, or a lot of people went out. There's some that still are bucking the system. We bought a mask. Whatever it looks like, some have got happy faces, some got black ones, some got red ones. I got musical instruments on mine, and, 
and uh, I see a checkerboard pattern. I see some medical masks for all the ones that want to be doctors. <laughs> I see a few school masks, and I see some multicolored masks. We put it on. It's a requirement. You go into a store today, they say, it's mandatory right on the door, on the door of our church. It says mandatory, mass mandatory. Right. It's mandatory when you go into a place of business. I'm going to tell you something. As a Christian, your prayer life is mandatory. It's not something that is an option. It's not something that you can do if you want to. It is a requirement. If you want to get into the presence of God, you need to learn how to pray. If you want to be effective in reaching somebody else for God, you need to learn how to pray. If you want to see sins forgiven, you need to learn how to pray. If you want to have a healing ministry, it's not going to happen because you can lay your hand on somebody. You need to learn how to pray because when we learn how to pray, that's when we touch the hand of God. It's mandatory. Jesus' prayer showed us the importance of humanity touching deity. Somebody said, why did Jesus pray if he was God? Because he wanted to show us the importance that he even needed to touch deity. His human side still needed to reach out to deity. We can't survive on our own as humans. As Christians, we need the element of God's presence. We need communion with God. You say, oh, I, I'm getting by pretty good. Are you really getting by spiritually if you're not talking to God? Are you really surviving spiritually if you don't have a communication link between you and the Father? Are you really surviving if you don't pray one minute out of the day? I can answer that for you if you can't. No. No. Mark states that Jesus got up early in the morning to pray. There's other verses of Scripture that talked about Him going and praying in the afternoon or Him praying in the evening. It even talks about Him going to a solitary place to pray. Something about that solitary place when you can talk to God and you can lay it on. Talk to Him. Just lay it right out there. Here I am, God. He prayed at night. What an example. He prayed in the morning. I did not sleep real well last night. I don't know why. I have no idea why. I was late getting to bed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> late getting to bed and, and uh, I lay there and, and uh, you know, if you had those nights you just... And I thought, Lord, you know, I tell somebody else and I, and me, I didn't count sheep. I, I don't know where that ever come from, but I began to pray. And the more I prayed, the less I felt like sleeping. <laughs> I don't know why that was either, but it just, and I enjoyed it. You say, are you tired this morning? Not really. I'm not tired. I'm surprised because I really was awake a long time. I got to bed around 1230 this morning and it was probably about two o'clock. I looked over at the clock and I was still, now my wife would say I was snoring. I might've been snoring, but I was still awake. <laughs> Because I remember praying, you know, just talking to the Lord. And, and uh, he prayed in the morning. He prayed before accomplishing miracles. Jesus did not do miracles. He prayed. Right. Yet we expect to see miracles happen without prayer. The sick and afflicted, before he done anything, he prayed. He prayed for his disciples in the upper room before departing to Gethsemane. He prayed for his enemies while he hung on the cross. Yeah. So tell me one of the most important things that Jesus recognized that his need to do was to pray. What an example for us of what we need to do is we need to learn that we need to pray. He clearly showed us that prayer was a source of power. It was a source of strength. Even though he was God manifested in the flesh, he needed to have that spiritual direction and that spiritual guidance that he received through prayer. Jesus prayed, and if we're going to be effective in this spiritual journey, I'm going to tell you, we need to pray also. The command to pray, Jesus commanded His followers to pray on the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray. Right. When you pray. It wasn't, if you pray. 
If means that it could be an optional thing and it's okay if I don't do it. So if I decide, I'm going to do it. But Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, when you pray. In other words, it was very common that they understood that there was an expectation of them to pray. Prayer was not optional for the early church. And I'll tell you, for this church today, any church today, it's not an option for us to say, I don't think I need to pray today. We live in the 20th century. We need to pray more than ever before because we live in the 20th century. Jesus even challenged us to pray. He didn't just tell us that we needed to. He challenged us. He said, ask. And it shall be given you. Now that's a pretty good challenge. If I need something from God, what do I got to do? I got to ask. But he's supposed to know what I need before I ever ask him. He does. But the challenge is, do I really know what I need? You know, I need to ask. If we don't ask, we shouldn't expect to receive. Asking and receiving are two conditions that are met together. I ask, I receive. Now, I didn't go when I was a young person, and, and my father, I would go once in a while and get some gas money from him, and I didn't go up to father and just stand and look at him, look him in the eyes, and expect him to know what I wanted. And he didn't look at me and say, you know, are, are you, what's the matter? I'd say, Dad, can I get some money for gas? I'd ask. And he would give me, reach into his pocket and give me money for gas. I'd receive. But if, imagine if I had just walked up and I just stood there and looked at him. And if he said, what do you need? And I just stood there and said nothing. I would not receive nothing. He might know what I needed. But I needed to ask. And our Heavenly Father wants us to ask so that he can give it to us. When the disciples were in effect of casting demons out of a child, in the Bible, in Matthew 17, it says this, Jesus said to them, he said, there's a spiritual concept that is missing here. In this conquest, this only is accomplished by prayer and fasting. Or fasting and prayer. You guys haven't met the challenge. You forgot to pray. You forgot to fast. There's some things that are only going to happen through fasting and prayer. And you're out here trying to do something and you're being ineffective of it. And the thing is, is because there's some things that only happen by fasting and prayer. And I want to tell you, there's still things in our generation today that are only going to happen by fasting and by prayer. And until we really get a hold of that, I think we're missing an element of revival. I really do. I think we're missing a big element of revival until we get a hold of fasting and prayer. You know, there's an importance of the spiritual aspect of fasting. Not only are we missing the aspect of revival, but we're missing one of the spiritual growth things that is required of us. Right. Boys, I try, I, I'm just having such a hard time, preacher. I've had a hard time for the last month. I, I, you know, I don't know why, but the devil's on my back. Well, why don't you fast and pray and get him off it? You know, Really? You know, I, I really wouldn't like him to be on my back week after week after week. That would kind of get annoying after a while. So if I want to get him off and it's not happening because I'm just going through the life normally, why don't I start fasting and praying and watch things happen? See, if we want to grow spiritually, we've got to put ourselves in the place where we're capable and able to grow spiritually. And that means sometimes it's just us laying aside the things that we do on a regular basis and say, God, I'm going to take today and I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray. Do you know morality is at an all-time low in our generation? I don't think I'm telling you anything surprising. Common decency is in decay and disarray. Every day you can go on some of the media. Now, I know there's a lot, 95% of it's about COVID. But the other 5% is usually about somebody stealing something. You know? And so you look at the decay of society. When somebody doesn't respect somebody else's things, and you say, man, we live in a terrible society, and yet we've got people that say, I don't need to pray. Are you hearing me this morning? You know, the society that is in such a mess. And we can clasp our hands and say, Hallelujah, praise God. It's wonderful living for God. But do we realize how big of a mess society is really in and how much they really need a church to be powerful instead of powerless how much they need a church that knows how to pray instead of a church that's just playing the game 
Pray so that we'll have the power of God to face the situations of life. You know, I think of the scripture, and I don't like to be negative in all the, you know, in this sense, but there's a scripture in the Bible that said, unless those days be shortened, the very elect would be deceived. I think about the fact that, you know, we're living in a day where there's a lot of people really questioning themselves and their spirituality. Really questioning themselves. If you've got a real relationship with God, there would be no question. Just, just be no question at all. The thing is, is I think what has happened over the years, remember earlier I talked about communion, about we need to teach our kids about communion. We need to explain to them what communion is. When we had our communion service this morning, there's little kids that, that what age is it that all of a sudden we say, you know, you're a knowledge level that you should be able to take communion. I don't agree with a, a baby as soon as they're old enough to drink a cup and taking, and taking communion because they have no idea what's going on. But I think we need to train our children and teach our children and find a place where we can sit with them in a, in a, in a communion service and say, now you remember what we talked about. This is representing the body of Jesus Christ and this is representing the blood of Jesus Christ. I have no problem if you're sitting by a child and you're explaining that. None. They need to know. So we teach them about communion. We teach them about giving to the things of God, whether it's time or whether it's finances, whether it's tithing, offerings, whatever. We teach them. That, that's important to teach them. You can't teach them if you don't do it. And they'll never understand the blessings unless they see you blessed from doing it. You know, I've often said, you know, if a person just would understand what God can do with what you don't have. Right. I'm telling you. I have heard a preacher one time preach about, you know, and he, he used an object lesson. He took one of those things that they cook with that's got all the holes in it. And he, he said, now he said, and he was using it, in a, and we as teenagers, I suppose, at the time he was using it in, in water, and he said, this is what happens. He said, when you're trying to live for God and, and you're not giving and you're just, you know, it's, it's running out. And then he used a ladle, you know, one of the things that, that held the water. And he said, but this is what God does with what you don't have. And see, the thing is, is we got to understand, but when it comes to prayer, it's no different. If we want our children to really comprehend and understand prayer, we need to be doing it. We need, to, we need to find that time ourselves where we're away somewhere in our prayer closet or talking to God or whatever. I find my office is a wonderful little spot. You know, I go off in my office and I'll sit there and, and I, you know, sometimes just staring at the ceiling, talking to God. It's a wonderful place to pray. And the disciples in watching Jesus, the one thing, out of all the things, and the, I've just always been so astounded by this. The one thing they could have said to Jesus Give us a good job, give us money, give us prestige, give us whatever. And they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Right. Teach us to pray. As Jesus was preparing to send to heaven at the close of his earthly ministry, he told his disciples, he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Tarry there for the Holy Ghost. Perhaps there was 500 people or so that started in the upper room. There was more than the 120 that wound up there in the end. There was a lot that probably started that day in the upper room. And they prayed and they worshiped God. Well, the pr real prayer warriors stayed behind. Right. They, they put the effort in and they received the blessing. Those that obeyed the command and tarried was the ones that actually received the promise. And we have so many promises in the Bible about praying. And what happens when we pray? There's no shortcuts to power in the church. Prayer is one of those things that's needed. Prayer prepares us for the avenues of communication so that we can receive the Word of God. If somebody's ministering, if we've been praying, we, we're so much more receptive after we've been praying. The Spirit of God can speak to us if we've been praying. But if we're just simply not praying, we're missing. So the command that Jesus left is to pray. Now, I know time's gone this morning. I'd like to get into some of the seasons of prayer. And, and uh, maybe next week I'll carry this on. Prayer, you know, it's not just a verbal, lengthy thing that we do, but it's something we do on an all-the-time basis. The Bible said to pray always. 
pray without ceasing. It means keep your attitude and your mind in the, right. in the spirit right. of prayer. And the two things, let's go back to them in, in closing this morning. The two things that I want you to recognize is God wants to meet our needs. Yes. God wants to meet our needs, but we have to meet Him at the cross. God wants to meet our needs, but He desires that we meet Him at the cross. He doesn't want to meet our needs and then just have us walk away. Right. The biggest thing is, is some people think that they can pray today and if God meets their needs tomorrow, they'll just walk away. The problem with that is, is next time you pray, what do you think that just things are just going to fall in place every time you ask and you want? It's like the whining child. You know, you get a, a child that, the and, and, and forgive me if, if this doesn't set well, but this is the way it is. I'll see some kid in the store and they're whining and they're just screaming and hollering and their parents give them something and away they go. I want to tell you, that child learned that long time before that. They learned that probably months or years before that where they learned that I can whine and get. And they, they whine next time and it gets louder and more boisterous and then they scream and throw themselves and, and the parents, oh, just give it to them, shut them up. Mistake number one. I don't care if you're, my kids can tell you, I wouldn't care if you was in the grocery store where you was. If you start doing that, you're going to get your rear end swatted. You know, that's enough of that. That's, you got to stop that. Sit in that thing or if it's a whatever, behave. You know, you give in to that, that whining and after a while, you know what, it just, it just it, that, that's how I get, I'll do it. I want to tell you, God's not into us every time we just want something, we whine, He's going to give it to us. And the next time we, oh God, and He's expected, he, He's not going to do that. Right. He wants us to come to Him. He wants to meet our needs. But He wants to meet us at the cross. Every time He wants to meet us at the cross. Let's stand this morning. I uh, wished I'd had time to get through some of the rest of the message this morning. About praying continually an encouragement to pray. I hope this morning this helped give us kind of a kickstart for prayer because I probably will teach on it again next week. And We need to pray. You know, the one thing I believe, and, and I'm a strong believer, that if we would pray, we would see the hand of God move in all the things that we're seeing going on in our world. If we would pray. If your family needs something, if we would pray, watch God move. Watch God move. We've all got stories about when we prayed, certain things happened. You know, and it wasn't always the big profound prayers. I could take you back to some very simple prayers that I prayed. You know, that something wasn't happening or something was going wrong. And I just, oh God, I, I, are you there, Lord? Are you really listening to me? Lord, I need your help. And then all of a sudden, boom, the next day or within hours, he does what needed to be done. may not be what I expected, but He does what needed to be done to help me in those situations. God bless you this morning. We're going to pray this morning in closing. And uh, we do encourage you, if you can, come out to service tonight, 6 o'clock. It's so good to see you. Be sure to, when you leave, make sure that you do your social distancing and all that. We want to stay safe, and uh, we want to uh, keep others safe. You know, it's not just about me. It's about others too. So let's remember that. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful this morning. Lord, an opportunity that we've had together in your house today again. Lord, your presence and your anointing, we're just so thankful for it. We pray, Lord, as we leave this place today, that Lord, the words that were spoken regarding prayer would lodge in our hearts and let us to understand how important it is that we pray. Bless each one that's here this morning. As we go, keep us safe. Keep your hand upon us. Keep us free from sickness and disease. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. Be sure to greet one another with a smile and a wave of a hand.